get started. So here. Thank you everyone for joining us today. This is the Montana Institute on Drug Cut Seminar Series. Um, a lot of new faces today. So this is a weekly seminar series featuring um, different speakers from across campus and then other kind of agency nonprofit just folks from around the state. So thank you so much for joining us today as well as braving the weather to come out. Uh, always again a wild card when it snows super heavily on seminar day. But today I have the honor um, of introducing Dr. David Hodge, who is the PR presenter for the day. Move out a little bit more. Um, so I'm going to provide a brief introduction as well. So David is an associate professor of chemical and biological engineering here at MSU. And the research in his group is focused on conversion technologies for the production of renewable fuels, chemicals, polymers, and materials from plant biomass, which I'm assuming is That's the, the title. topic yeah. of today's presentation. Yeah. Um, but before his appointment at Montana State, he was an associate <coughs> professor at Michigan State University. And Dr. Hodge received his PhD in chemical engineering from Colorado State University. So let's give mm -hmm. a warm welcome for David. <laughs> All right, well, thanks. So, uh, like you heard, I'm going to be talking today about some of the research uh, that I've been doing. Actually, most of this research is things that we've been working on since I've arrived at Montana State University two years ago. And so, I'll give a brief introduction to uh, some of the, 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 this, this whole uh, topic area and so some of the things that we do in our lab. And then I'll go through uh, three different projects and some of the work and some of the publications that we've done on these three different topics, all related to biomass conversion to fuels and chemicals. So just a, a brief introduction to what we do in my lab. So you can see here, so I'm chemical engineers and chemical engineers like to break everything down in process flow diagrams and these uh, block flow diagrams. So what you can see here is, uh, flow of material, so energy and carbon into biological feedstocks. And so my research here fits into this block here. So we do uh, looking at technologies for conversion of plant biomass. So this involves things like reactions, catalysis, biological catalysis, chemical catalysis, separations, process integration, putting everything together to have processes to make bio-based products, so renewable fuels, chemicals, and materials. And so, had this, this uh, saying here, this is the, the major theme is understanding and improving integrated processes for uh, plant, uh, plant biomass. And so you can see here, actually my lab at Michigan State, I still include this, but my lab in, at Michigan State was right at the corner of Science Road and Farm Lane. So I thought this was a, a really, good, uh, really good analogy for the kind of, kind of things that we do, do in our, our, our lab here. So yeah, so fundamental research science and then also applied agriculture, yeah, farm, so. Uh, so this is not not my data. This is actually from from NASA, and I think actually the group that uh, uh, did this animation might be at uh, actually well yeah we do have the have this animation might actually be at University of Montana. And so what you can see here is uh, you can see the time there, and this is carbon fixation by terrestrial plants. And so really what I wanted to do in showing this was just to show the potential of plant biomass as a renewable source of carbon. So you can think a lot of the materials and chemicals and fuels that we currently use and that are all around us, these, these things are derived from uh, petrochemical feedstocks, so primarily uh, fossil, you know, so primarily uh, petroleum and also natural gas. And so those were ultimately the, uh, uh, derived from carbon that was sequestered under the, uh, sequestered in the earth you know, tens or hundreds of millions of years ago and from, from plants ultimately. And so that's uh, one of the reasons for the current, uh, current uh, challenges we're facing in terms of CO2 accumulation and global warming. And so one of the advantages with using plant biomass, if this can be done in a way that doesn't result in net carbon accumulation, is that these are ultimately derived from renewable sources of carbon rather than fossil sources of carbon. And so just a little bit of an introduction for what are some of the different types of biomass that we might be talking about. So food crops, agriculture, so cereal grains, oilseed crops, sugar cane, uh, yeah, a lot of different, uh, different food crops, of course. And so those primarily, uh, you can use things like sucrose, starch, protein, or lipids. So what we're primarily interested in is using lignocellulose. So that's everything except the, uh, typically these are the uh, either seeds or storage tissues in plants. 
So what we're interested in is using the, uh, the cell walls of the plant. So this is all the other plant material. So think examples include things like uh, corn stover, agriculture, or forestry residues, or even things like dedicated energy crops. So bioenergy grasses, that's a picture of an undergraduate of mine standing next to, I think that's a decorative switchgrass that was growing outside one of the buildings on, uh, on campus at Michigan State. So these are some, some examples of potential feedstocks that one might use for, uh, for making uh, these materials. What's the cast of characters, at least on the chemical level? So plant cell walls are comprised <coughs> primarily of three classes of polymers. These include lignin, which is an aromatic polymer, and these two classes of polysaccharides, hemicelluloses, and cellulose. And so the uh, cellulose is a polymer of glucose and hemicellulose is a polymer of a uh, number of different types of sugars depending on the plant source. And so what is, like how, how do these things uh, vary by plant source? So you can see here a uh, number of different uh, taxonomically diverse plants. You can see it, the, uh, the distribution of some of these different, uh, different components. And I just want to simplify this. These are the structural polysaccharides here that include the hemicelluloses and cellulose. And this is the lignin here. So the mass of a plant is probably going to be anywhere from 95, like 80 percent to 95 percent cell walls. And so that's what we're interested in developing processes for making value out of these uh, these polymers. And so going up, so that was at the molecular scale, going up uh, oh, about uh, yeah, 10 or no, about a thousand orders of magnitude in scale. This is at the uh, the cell wall le uh, level. So you can see here what. Uh, I think the, a lot of these are microscopy images of, actually, yeah, all of these are, yeah, light microscopy or confocal microscopy images. Ah, well, there's one TEM of uh, various uh, plant cell walls from different sources. So you can see here some of the uh, food crops. This would be, uh, you can see the here, these are the cell walls in corn endosperm. These little, little spheres in here are starch granules. And this would be a soybean oleosome. These are uh, lipid bodies within those. And so those are your, uh, I guess those might be what you could consider first generation uh, biofuel feedstocks, so using food crops. So what we're interested in is using some of these uh, diverse tissues from various plants. We're not interested in using Arabidopsis for this example. So, <laughs> so just an example of, uh, yeah, so, so what, are, what, are the, uh, what are some of the structures in, the, um, in these plants at the cellular level? And I'll actually talk about some of the work that we're doing where uh, so like different cell types and different tissue types, how we're gonna try to exploit some of that for developing uh, better processes. Okay, so here's a very, very high level summary of what are some of the uh, technologies that we're interested in. So at a very, very high level, here's a process flow diagram showing taking lignocellulosic biomass, doing something called a biomass deconstruction, which was uh, coined by a colleague of mine, Jonathan Walton at, uh, at Michigan State in the paper from 30 years ago or so. So uh, what this basically is taking, taking the biomass and doing some kind of chemical or catalytic or thermal processing to generate uh, sets of usable uh, compounds, possibly, air, or possibly uh, monomers, or you can also generate sets of polymers, and then subjecting those after you've done some kind of deconstruction, basically breaking down the higher order structure of the cell wall into these sets of intermediates, then go through some kind of conversion process. So like, for example, a biological conversion. So a good example of that is just yeast fermentation of glucose to make ethanol, or yeah, you can do, do lots of things with biology. And of course you can do lots of things with catalysis too. So do some kind of conversion to make renewable fuels, chemicals, and yeah, other things, which are cut off the bottom, <laughs> polymeric materials. So, and as an example of this, um, here's a, a process. I've actually been working on uh, processes like this uh, for, yeah, since I was in grad school. So this is a, what's called a uh, pretreatment, which is basically cooking plant biomass in the presence of a solvent, possibly an acid, possibly a base, uh, possibly with the addition of elevated temperature and pressure to fractionally solubilize out uh, certain components from the cell wall and possibly redistribute some of these different, uh, different components within the cell wall. And so in one of these processes, dilute acid pretreatment, this is something that's been People have been working on this for many, many years. Uh, NREL, National Renewable Energy Laboratory, they had a pilot plant devoted to this. And this company, uh, Poet, they've built a, a demonstration scale plant in Iowa where they're uh, taking biomass, uh, corn stover in this case, uh, cooking it with uh, dilute sulfuric acid, solubilizes out uh, some of the xylan, which is a hemicellulose, 
and then you can add enzymes, which are specific for breaking down cellulose to solubilize out the, uh, the glucose. And so the idea with this is you could generate fermentable sugars from this, and then they ferment those to, uh, to ethanol. And then you have this lignin product left over, so this insoluble lignin product. And so this is kind of cool. I got to visit this plant uh, a couple of years ago, and you can just to see the scale that they're doing this, all of this is uh, corn stover here that they, they're collecting from... Uh, from farms in the area. And so these are the filter presses at the end of the process, and they're generating this material, this insoluble lignin cake, which I'll talk about that in a little bit about in, um, in one of the projects that, that we have. And so challenges to doing this and commercializing these technologies are logistics, so year-round supply storage and transportation of these feedstocks, high capital costs relative to starch and sugar-derived ethanol. So you might have an order of magnitude difference in the amount of capital that you'd need to, uh, to, put, or to, to put in the ground to make one liter of, uh, of, uh, of ethanol from cornstarch versus what you'd need to make uh, that same liter or gallon from, uh, from uh, cellulosic biofuels. So a lot more uh, capital intensive. Uh, there's processing challenges. These are some of the things that we're We've, at least in the past, we've looked at in, in the lab and we have ongoing projects addressing some of these. And also the need to uh, uh, diversify the co-product portfolio beyond ethanol. So currently this plant is only making, uh, making ethanol and then they're taking this lignin residue and burning it. So as examples of other co-products, this is showing, this is a very complicated slide. I put this together for a presentation I gave about five or six years ago. So some of these companies actually aren't still around anymore. But uh, what this is highlighting, these green arrows are representing uh, biological conversion routes. The red arrows are representing catalytic conversion routes. And so what this is showing is a number of different ways you can have uh, biocatalytic or catalytic routes for making uh, renewable polymers as, as one example. So uh, yeah, so this is showing some of these routes and some of these hybrid routes for making various products. And so there's a lot of companies interested in these, these things. I guess one. One thing that, uh, yeah, it's, it's currently has a lot of, uh, it's, it's, yeah, so a lot of uh, uh, market penetration now is this uh, Broschem process for making, uh, uh, so these PET uh, water bottles. I don't know if anybody's seen these, but these are something called the plant bottle. This is so actually the, the E, or the PE in, uh, in, in PET uh, plastics, that's uh, polyethylene terephthalate. So one, one half of this is ethylene, and so I guess there's a, number of plants in Brazil that are making uh, uh, polyethylene terephthalate from, uh, from, uh, from ethanol that's derived from sugar cane. So that's one example. There's a, there's a lot of other, and also I, I'm not, I'm not uh, covering everything, the entire scope of the industry, but uh, yeah, there's a lot, of, a lot of interest in doing other things besides making ethanol from the renewable sugars. Also something that we're interested in doing in our group is looking at other applications for lignin. So uh, typically, a lot of there's been a lot of uh, commercial effort in uh, thermochemical conversions. So uh, just direct combustion, gasification, or pyrolysis. Or also, I'll talk some about the work that we're doing with polymeric lignans. So products from these, so polyurethanes and phenol formaldehyde adhesives. And then also, we're doing some work with uh, depolymerizing uh, lignin to make aromatic monomers. And so. Um, yeah, so some of the challenges with some of these applications is lignin's not a uh, simple homopolymer like uh, cellulose. It's uh, a random polymer comprised of a number of different monomers uh, involved in a number of different linkages. And so also when you do these chemical modifications, uh, yeah, or, or these chemical treatments, the lignin gets modified. And so, yeah, so there's a lot of heterogeneity within this polymer. And then also, when you try to do chemistry on this, yeah, it's hard to get high yields of any one product at high yield. Probably more expensive than uh, petrochemical alternatives. I'll just go through a couple examples of some work that we've done in my lab and also some work that's done in collaborators' labs. So uh, one of these, uh, one way to uh, depolymerize this is uh, uh, a catalytic oxidation. And so this is an example from a paper we published a few years ago with uh, depolymerizing uh, lignans derived. This one's from a hybrid poplar from a process, like that was from a process, from an alkaline pretreatment process. So you can see here the, the range of compounds and what is the yield on lignans. So typically very low yields, depending on the properties of the lignin, the source of the lignans, the prior processing history. 
Uh, yeah, you can see here one of the main compounds is this vanillin, which is the, uh, the compound in uh, vanilla, which uh, so there's actually were, I think at one time up until the 1980s, something like 80% of the world's artificial vanilla was produced in a, a paper mill in Canada. And now there's still a few companies making artificial vanilla from, from lignin, but most of it's derived from uh, petroleum uh, as, a, as a raw material the artificial vanilla. Here's a few other applications. So this is actually not my work. This is work that, that was uh, from a collaborator of mine, uh, Joe Stanzioni at Rowan University, looking at using some of these compounds. So I think from these, these products he, he was using, uh, uh, so this is vanillin. He was using vanillin alcohol and making uh, bisphenol replacements for these. So you've probably heard about uh, bisphenol A and being an endoc endocrine disruptor and uh, people are looking for alternatives for uh, making making various types of polymers that might include BPA using other alternatives. Of course, I have no idea if this bisguiacol is actually also a, an endocrine disruptor. I don't think that's been established yet, but uh, yeah, it's interesting work. So he's, they're looking at uh, doing, at least in this case, thermoplastic uh, polyesters. And so just the cool thing with this is all of these, uh, all of these, these uh, compounds here are also uh, potentially uh, bio-based. And so they and they've demonstrated that these are also biodegradable by a uh, a, um, a uh, this bacterial cutinase, which is a esterase, which can actually break these bonds here. So that was pretty cool. That's some recent work from a collaborator of mine. And also, just to show how how novel our our work here is, people have been doing this for many years. This is a patent from 1948. So process for making a, a vanillin from uh, from lignin. These kinds of using copper catalyst and oxygen. It's been, Technologies have been around for a while. All right, so the first, first uh, project I'll talk about is, this is a DOE project that we have in collaboration with uh, Michigan State University and University of Wisconsin, and looking at copper catalyzed alkaline oxidative pretreatment. So this is an old paper, this is uh, from, from, from my group actually. So this data was generated by an undergraduate student working in my lab. Um, yeah, back in, that was probably like 2011 or so, and this was really the whole impetus for this whole project was we made the, we identified that adding this catalyst, so uh, two, two prime bipyridine uh, coordinating copper, when we added that with hydrogen peroxide and sodium hydroxide to biomass, uh, we added this in catalytic amounts, we significantly improved the amount of lignin that you remove from the, from the biomass, and then when you add Cellulose degrading or depolymerizing enzymes, you can get a lot more sugar out. And so this is showing the amount of sugar that you might be able to get from one of these processes versus the amount of catalyst that we add. And so you start out here with 30% uh, yields, and we find that you can improve those significantly, 80% or more, um, with, with the addition of catalyst. Another cool thing that we found was that uh, different plants have differing amounts of naturally occurring uh, uh, redox active metals. And so we've identified that actually this poplar that we had is, has, one of, has much, much lower uh, metal content than some of these other plants or some of these other trees. And so, we've, uh, so this is with adding no catalyst. And we found that uh, actually some of these, this was actually a silver birch that we uh, got from a paper mill in northern Sweden. It had a whole lot of copper or iron and yeah, copper as well. And so we didn't actually have to add any catalyst to this. And it, it actually, uh, uh, when, when you added the hydrogen peroxide, it, uh, it broke down the lignin and yeah, resulted in much better yields. We actually showed in, in the, the same paper that if you chelate out the, uh, we actually showed that that's what the, what, why you got such good yields. We actually, when you chelate out this, uh, these metals and then add the hydrogen peroxide, you get very, very low, low yields. And so that was actually the, uh, the metals associated with the plants results in improved uh, conversion for this. So that was, that was uh, and then we've also done work on this project looking at how we can improve the process. So looking at things like bed batch addition of the hydrogen peroxide, uh, including a separate alkaline pre-extraction step, and then combining these two things, we can get much better sugar yields. And we've also been able to correlate improving sugar yields with improving lignin removal in this process. So that's, uh, that's one of the things that we've done and uh, published some papers on. And so one of the things that we wanted to look at was for this two-stage process, which basically what we're doing with this is looking at uh, doing an alkaline treatment first, followed by this uh, copper AHP treatment step. Uh, we wanted to look at, you can remove lignin in both of these steps. And so what we wanted to do with this was basically look at how you can uh, 
uh, either improve the uh, lignin removal by with the alkaline step or with the uh, the secondary step in a process. How would how would you balance, for example, how much uh, lignin you removed it with in each step, and how, how would that impact process economics? How would that impact lignin properties and a potential co-product value, and also ultimately, yeah, process economics. So, what we wanted to do was look at hard, uh, hardwood wood chips. So in this case, it was hybrid poplar. Uh, do subject these to a, a two-stage uh, pretreatment process, generate lignans that a colleague of ours at University of Wisconsin was able to show to generate relatively high yields of monomers from these, and then uh, subject the uh, uh, biomass that's been delignified to enzymatic hydrolysis to generate sugars. And so the idea with this is then you could have a suite of different products. So for example, a variety of different lignin-derived aromatic products, and then also cellulosic sugars, and then also maybe some of the low-value lignans here that you could then use for various applications. And so you can see here the idea with this is yeah, generate number of different products. So for example, aromatics or flavor and fragrance compounds from the, uh, the aromatic monomers, uh, potentially use some of these oxidized aromatic ligamers in bio-based uh, adhesives, coatings, or foams for polyurethane applications, you see those polyols, and use, uh, yeah, generate sugar-derived uh, hydrocarbons or uh, biofuels, and then burn the low-value lignans. So that was the idea with this project. And uh, yeah, DOE decided to fund this two years ago, and this was fun. This was a, a, a something in the in the popular press. So you know, there's the the Make America Great Again. They they called this the project like this 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 project was called the Mega Bio. So they said Make Energy Great Again Bio via bio, Biomass. And so this was yeah. So this is a Mega Bio Vitamin Complex Multivitamins for Bio Refining. So this was something. Yeah. So we've. It, we, we saw in the uh, yeah, showed up on this website a few days after DOE announced they were funding this project. I thought that was that was fun. So what are we doing in the part of this this research at Montana State? So this is uh, what we're look, looking at the uh, the first stage, and so we're uh, looking at developing correlations between the first stage and process performance. We're going to characterize lignin properties and assess aromatic monomer yields from the lignans. And ultimately, this fits into this overall project. We want to understand the trade-offs between achieving high product, co-product value, uh, processing costs, and environmental costs through integration and optimization of this biomass deconstruction. So this is, this is one, one study within this project. I'm going to go through some of the results from this. And so this work was done by postdoc in my group, Sandeep Singh, who's sitting in the back of the room there. Most of this was actually some of it was done by some under help. He had some help from some undergraduates as well. So with this project, we were looking at a number of different hybrid poplar genotypes. We were looking at the impact of temperature, time, sodium hydroxide loading, and poplar genotype on uh, things that include bio, uh, mass solubilization and the potential for recovering uh, these lignans. And we wanted to assess uh, yeah, properties of the biopolymers and then also how this impacts the subsequent process, and also what, what are, what's the most uh, lignin that you can get, or monomers that you can get from these when you subject these to these lignins to depolymerization using two approaches, a cat, uh, two catalytic approaches. One's called bioacetylysis, and one is a two-stage formic acid catalyzed uh, oxidation, which a uh, collaborator at University of Wisconsin is doing that work. So here's an example of some of the data that we're generating. So this is showing at constant temperature, uh, varying time, how much mass we extract here at different alkali loadings versus how much mass we can recover. And also, this is another example at constant time, how increasing temperature increases uh, mass solubilization and the potential for mass recovery. So this recovered mass here, these are some of the, uh, the lignans that we'll then be characterizing. So this is just one example of uh, some of the data sets we generated yeah, hundreds and hundreds of data points from this but this is just one example of some of the correlations that we, uh, we showed for the for this data and so looking at uh, how this impacts downstream processing so this is looking at so this is the composition of the original biomass this is the composition after uh, we did our pre-extraction these are at three different pre-extraction conditions and so you can see you mostly solubilize out, what's that? So some lignin, some xylan, 
and this is showing for these these three extraction conditions what are the how much sugar you can get out so this is hydrolysis yields with uh with just the first stage and then this is what the hydrolysis yields increase to on the second stage and one of the things that we can show is that we can show that these these hydrolysis yields are correlated to how much lignin we remove this is hydrolysis yields in the first stage versus hydrolysis yields in the second stage. So these things are, are correlated and we published that uh, this year. Uh, another interesting thing is looking at the lignin properties. So this is a lot of, lot of information, but this is showing for the three genotypes. So that these, these three things are different poplar genotypes. And for these data here, this is the low temperature, 95 degrees C. This is the high temperature, 155 degrees C. So this is showing the, uh, the number of ether linkages within the, uh, within the polymer. This is showing the molar mass by gel permeation chromatography. So cool thing is, is you can actually see these things are correlated. So the ones that have higher ether, uh, con ether linkage content also are higher molecular weight and the polymers that are higher molecular weight also give higher yields of monomer. So this is when subjected to thioacetylysis, you can see you get more sugar more uh, aromatic monomers out from these, these materials. And I guess one of the reasons is, is when you do this at harsher conditions, you're both breaking these bonds and then also uh, reforming some bonds that make them uh, more difficult to depolymerize. So these results all make sense. Um, yeah, and so ongoing work with this project, or we, we were able to show that we could correlate all of these things to the conditions that we were using for pre-extraction uh, and also lignin properties could be correlated to uh, to uh, pre-extraction conditions, and we're done with screening. We're now on the stage of this project. We have 18 months left on this. We're looking at scale up and generating a lot more material, a lot more lignans that then our collaborators can do some work with. This is a reactor that we just got a couple weeks ago. We've been running this almost nonstop for the last two weeks, generating uh, lignans and generating uh, pre-treated wood chips, and yeah, so that's where we're going with that. Um, another project I'll talk about uh, that we have. This is a USDA funded project looking at how uh, processing uh, biomass impacts lignin properties. And so what we're doing with this is looking at using the lignans as a phenol replacement in phenol formaldehyde resins uh, for use as uh, adhesives in engineered wood products. And so the idea with this is uh, phenol formaldehyde resins, they pro they're something like 34% of the adhesive market, massive, uh, massive industrial market including things like plywood, uh, oriented strand board, laminated veneer lumber. Uh, so challenges, and so people have been looking at using uh, lignin as a, uh, a, a phenol replacement for these. So basically what we're looking at uh, using uh, lignin as a, uh, as a glue for making these engineered wood products and replacing fossil-based uh, phenol in these. And so challenges include high molecular weight, high polydispersity, and low reactivity. And so when we say low reactivity, you can compare this with phenol. So when you make these resins, uh, the phenol reacts with formaldehyde and reacts at uh, these uh, ortho or para positions on a phenol ring. Or if you have a terminal group on a lignin, you might have one you have no positions for this type of monomer. You might have one for this type of monomer. And you might have two for this type of monomer where you could incorporate, where you could cross-link and make these, uh, make these, uh, 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 resins. And so if you actually have these within a lignin polymer, you have no reactive sites. You don't have that free, free phenol there. Uh, so one of the things that we've been interested in doing is why, so I'll show these results actually later, but um, so looking at different lignin sources and uh, lignins that might be more suitable for these. So uh, for this, uh, grass lignins, they, they're known to have these special features uh, paracumeric acid in a number of grasses that are these esters here and they have would potentially have these two sites for incorporation whereas also some uh, some uh, some species of, uh, of woods here have also this uh, paracumeric or so uh, parahydroxybenzoate ester here that might also have sites for incorporation and so the thing is is if you did alkaline pulping on these you'd uh, break all these esters off and so you wouldn't have these available and so Modification of the lignin properties is going, to, is going to be an important thing during processing. And so, yeah, so one of the things that we've shown in some of our previous work is what's some of the diversity of these in various grasses. 
and can we use this knowledge to make better uh, lignans and make better processes for recovering uh, lignans and utilizing these lignans in materials. And so this is showing paracumeric, paracumeric acid content in diverse maize lines. So these are diverse maize genotypes. You can see you have a wide diversity just depending on the plant source. And so these are other grasses, switchgrass, and these are some other grasses. I can't really read these now in this campus. Big blue stem, side oats, gramma, but some other things we've looked at this. So there's actually a wide diversity, five fold differences in the content of this in the lignans, depending on the source. Another study, this is just within a single plant. And as a function of development stage, we've actually shown massive differences, threefold differences, depending on where you sample this from in the plant. So, and also as a function of development stage. So younger, younger, uh, younger, younger uh, plant cell or plant cell walls from younger tissues have higher contents of these. And so the, the thing that motivated this study was, uh, so this was work in a collaborator of mine, a collaborator's lab at Michigan State University. So this was work by uh, Mojkan Najad. She was able to show that she was screening all these different uh, lignin sources and was able to, sh and looked, was trying to make, use, uh, use these lignans as a phenol replacement for uh, these uh, wood adhesives. And so what she was able to show was that this one, uh, one lignin was able to uh, have properties. So what are we showing here? This is, so she, they, they did something called a shear lap test, was basically they took two pieces of wood and glued them together using this, uh, using this adhesive. And then they applied shear until either the wood failed or the adhesive failed and then measured what the shear was that, uh, where, where, where failure occurred. So this was, the uh, conventional one, and the only one that was comparable to this was this uh, this lignin here that had very high content of parahydroxyphenol um, aromatics. And so, one of the things that we were hypothesizing is that this actually came from this structure here. And so, yeah. And so, also, this was really exciting because this was the first time that lignin could be used as a 100% drop-in replacement of phenol without compromising product performance. And so. This was the uh, lignin derived from that uh, from that mill in uh, or from that plant in Iowa, where uh, we showed uh, yeah showed all the all that lignin being generated. So they're very interested in this, and USDA decided to fund this. And so one of the cool things with this is so as opposed to like uh, fossil resources where yeah where basically you get what's in the ground and then you have to do chemistry and separations to get what you want. You can actually breed plants to uh, have, have the features that, that you desire. So for example, um, the enzyme that's responsible for putting this on the, uh, on the lignin is actually known and it's been identified in the last eight years or so. Uh, you could also uh, potentially do physical fractionation because you have different abundances of this, uh, this type of uh, compound depending on where you are in the plant. Um, then you could also time the harvest, for example, if, that's, if this is what you're interested in. And then also uh, lignin processing history impacts the, the properties of the, and, and the relative abundance of this compound. And so that's something that's actually not really well understood. And that's what we're focusing on, at least as one study, uh, is looking at uh, how lignin processing impacts the abundance of this, uh, this compound. And so this is a USDA project. So we want to understand the fate of uh, paracumeric acid and grass lignans during processing and how its incorporation into PF resins impact properties and performance. And then also our collaborator at Michigan State University is going to be developing uh, resin formulations for, with optimal reactivity for, uh, derived from these lignans. And so I guess one of the things that we want to do, I think I just said this, we want to understand the fate of uh, paracumeric acid during dilute acid pretreatment in diverse maize genotypes, characterize the evolution of the lignin properties during these treatments, and determine trade-offs between obtaining high sugar yields versus lignin property, uh, the desired lignin properties. And so this is showing, um, so we have this maize diversity set that we got from a collaborator at, uh, in the Department of Agronomy at the uh, University of Wisconsin. They have all these different maize genotypes with different properties, different cell wall contents, different abundances of lignin, paracumeric acid, and we took, for this, we decided to sample from some of the extremes in uh, paracumeric acid content and lignin content and subject these to processing. Uh, so basically cooking these, I'm not gonna go through the details of these, but basically cooking these at different times 
at different pHs, actually in all of these are at the same temperature, uh, and looking at how that impacts these properties and also how much sugar you can get out of this. And so this is the raw data, well not really raw data, but this is the data on how much xylan we solubilize. So what, basically what we're doing is from uh, going from left to right, this is showing increasing uh, severity during this uh, dilute acid pretreatment, and this is showing how much xylan we solubilize. And so this is for the different, different genotypes. And what this is showing is how much glucose you get out when you then subject these to enzymatic hydrolysis using cellulase enzymes. And so this is with no treatment, and this is and these bars are with increasing severity treatment. We don't have data for every single condition for every single genotype, but you can kind of get an idea of the trends here. Um, correlating these things together, one of the things that we're sh we can show is that, uh, oh, I don't think I showed the PCA solubilization. Oh well, that's all right. So one of the things we can show here, and this is something that's well understood that people have done this for many years, is that increasing xylan solubilization during the pretreatment is correlated to the amount of sugar that you can get out in the subsequent enzymatic hydrolysis stage. And so one of the things that uh, uh, Brian Saulnier, a grad student in my lab, he's sitting in the back of the room that he, he, he did was we were able to show how this, how uh, paracumeric acid solubilization during this pretreatment, this is, can also be correlated to this. And so ideally, we would probably be wanting to minimize, if we wanted to do this, at least as we're hypothesizing this might work, uh, we want to uh, run this process where you get high con or minimize PCA solubilization and maximize sugar yields. So at least so far, these are the best conditions that we found here for getting high sugar out without uh, solubilizing too much PCA. And so that's ongoing work, and we're hoping to publish this, these data, this data relatively soon. So the last part of my talk, I'll talk about uh, another project that we have on physical fractionation of biomass and understanding how uh, heterogeneity within biomass, uh, you know, heterogeneity within biomass impacts processing and how we can apply different, uh, different approaches to this for improving uh, processing. So one of the ideas with this is you could do something like on-field fractionation. So this is exactly what takes place in uh, a combine harvester. That's the basis for mechanized agriculture is, uh, is a fractionation of, uh, of plant biomass. Uh, so, or these kinds of things can be done at a processing facility. And so I'll go through a couple examples of these. So things might include uh, uh, some type of milling or particle size reduction and then some type of classification. So classification by sieving or flotation or air classification. A number of different ways this could be done. And so um, what, would what, what are some of the outcomes that might happen from uh, for physically fractionating biomass. This might include uh, generating uh, uh, different fractions that might be enriched or depleted in certain target properties. So examples of these might be ash, um, elemental composition. So there's actually, I know that there's some work with uh, just uh, harvesting um, like the tops and the leaves and the cobs from corn, corn stover and then uh, Send, uh, throwing the, uh, the stems back onto the field because that has a lot more of the, uh, the ash because you need to return some, some, of the, uh, some of the plant material to the field for both erosion control and also to return some of the minerals to the soil. Um, yeah, so that's an example of things that you might have certain properties that might be uh, desirable for some applications, less desirable for other applications that you could do with fractionation. So another, another analogy to this is thinking about like in a petroleum refinery, you know, you don't just send your crude oil into, a, into some type of targeted conversion process. You do some kind of fractionation first through distillation, and then you have all these different fractions, which you might do additional separations and then additional conversions on those fractions. So you don't just have your, your bulk heterogene, heterogene, heterogeneous uh, material send that directly into a conversion process. So that's one of the things that we're thinking we can do and potentially tailor feedstock properties to a conversion process. And so this is an example from work that was done by collaborators of ours at Idaho National Laboratories doing uh, air classification where you can uh, fractionate uh, when you subject corn stover to different uh, particle size reduction approaches, you can then get, uh, and, and then do air classification, uh, you can uh, generate different uh, fractions that might be enriched or depleted in different, uh, different tissues or different plant organs.
so yeah, so here, here's an idea of how something like this might work. So you might be able to take heterogeneous feedstocks. Uh, you might be able to do something at something called a decentralized biomass processing depot, where you could do some types of treatments at the uh, smaller scale. So this might, rather than at some massive centralized facility, so this would facilitate things like uh, 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 transportation and simplify feedstock logistics, if you wanted to actually make, make an industry out of this. And so then the idea with this is also you might be able to generate a diverse suite of products that might include uh, cellulosic biofuels or chemicals. You might have some uh, materials that you could send to anaerobic digestion for biogas or maybe high lignin uh, biomass, what you could use for fuel pellets, or you could have some, uh, some low recalcitrant biomass that you could use for animal feeds, for example. And also when you do these pretreatments on biomass, it makes them much more digestible by ruminants. So that's actually people have been looking at you know, technologies like ammoniation or treating with lime that actually makes, uh, makes plant biomass more digestible by ruminants. So here's an idea, Here, here's kind of the idea where red being negative, green being positive. These are different properties of, uh, that you might have for, uh, for different biomass fractions. So lignin might be bad for some of these applications, whereas it's good for solid fuels. Um, yeah, protein content, obviously that's gonna be good for certain, content, certain, uh, certain applications. And well, some of these are good for all of these, but so. Anyway, the idea with this is that some things are good for some and bad for the others, and you maybe you can do a fractionation to improve uh, or to enrich or deplete uh, the, the biomass in certain of these fractions. So this is showing a, uh, sorry about that's cut off, but so this is from a paper we published last year uh, showing a cross-section of a sorghum stem. And what this is showing is different cell types and different tissue types within the stem. So you can probably imagine this like, similar to a corn stem, if you've ever like, looked at a, across the corn stem, you have different tissue types. You have pith cells, which might comprise 30% of the stem. These are low in lignin, very highly digestible. Uh, you have vascular bundles that might comprise 15% of these. Uh, you have yeah, rind fibers, might comprise 50% of the mass and epidermis. So significant differences in tissues, differences in the cell wall composition and significant differences in the properties. Actually, that's something I didn't even show. I don't have the data to show this, but one of the things that we've also shown is that these uh, pith uh, tissues here are extremely hygroscopic. That means they uh, can absorb a lot of water. And one of the things that we show is that these, actually, no, I do, I do show that later. So I'll just save that for later. And so as an example of this, uh, they're actually, uh, uh, people actually do, uh, apply physical fractionation of stems, grass stems, in, uh, when, when making a paper from uh, 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 sugar cane, it's called bagasse, which is the, uh, the uh, after, after you've extracted the sugar from the, uh, the sugar cane stems, the waste material is called the bagasse. And there's actually uh, industrial processes for doing this in like Mexico, Thailand, uh, South Africa, and uh, Brazil. So they actually subject the biomass to some type of milling and screening and remove the pith, which is extremely hygroscopic and is not, it has poor fiber strength and also poor drainability when you try to make paper from these. And so these kinds of technologies exist. And so what we are hoping to do is look at how you can do physical fractionation. So this is one study that I'll be talking about. We published it uh, last year looking at how you can exploit uh, within plant heterogeneity to generate uh, uh, and, and how, how this impacts the properties. So this is actually cut off here. But what this is, is we looked at two different uh, sorghum genotypes. One was uh, this, uh, what's called a photosensitive energy hybrid, which is what's, yeah, what this means is it has delayed flowering, which has extended vegetative growth, which results in increased biomass yields. And so this was a, a cultivar developed by um, some people we're working with at Texas A&M. So obviously this TX <laughs> stands for Texas. And so this is, and we compared these results to a commercial uh, sweet sorghum cultivar, uh, Della. So you can't see this, but this is the amount of sugar that you get out from the Della. This is the sugar that we got out from the, uh, the, uh, the, the TX uh, variety. And so you can see this one, probably has an accumulated, yeah, this one's still, probably still accumulating sugar because it was harvested before flowering. And so 
we looked at uh, manual fractionation of this first, and so we subjected these to either pretreatment or no pretreatment. Then we added uh, enzymes to hydrolyze the, uh, the plant cell walls. And so, sorry about this. Yeah, this is PIP. This is uh, vascular bundles and outer rind. And this is inner rind, and this is vascular epidermis and outer rind. So this is we had one fraction here that was basically these this one fraction that was primarily these uh, vascular bundles and one fraction that was primarily the, uh, the pit. And what you can see here is this is, uh, you can see that with even with no pretreatment, we can just add enzymes and get very, very high yields with, with the pit. And so this is, the, the dark is with no pretreatment and then the light is with pretreatment. So you can see some fractions after pretreatment, you can get a lot of sugar out of these and some of them are still, are much more recalcitrant, so much more difficult to, uh, to digest, either by enzymes or by ruminants. And so one of the things we showed is, yeah, significant differences in these tissues, significant heterogeneity, and they process, will process significantly differently. Um, so this is some imaging, and so this is showing some of these different fractions. Yeah, this is the outer rind epidermis, this is the inner rind vascular bundles, and then this is the pit. And so you can see this is, uh, Confocal microscopy with the red is autofluorescence of lignin. So you can kind of get an idea of different particle sizes, different particle, uh, different cell types, and also different relative abundances of lignin. So relatively low lignin pith in these. Uh, so the next thing we did with this was uh, look at uh, physical fractionation. So that was manual physical fractionation by plant anatomy. The next thing that we did was look at uh, how we can do this um, yeah, at, or actually looking at process, a physical fractionation process. So we did, uh, what's, we, we call this wet disintegration, which is basically putting the biomass in a blender <laughs> for a certain amount of time, but wet disintegration and then followed by sieving to mimic an industrial depithing process. And so, he, and then we screened or, or uh, collected the material on a number of different, uh, different uh, uh, mesh size sieves and looked, this is how the biomass at least, and so, when you subject this to different types of uh, milling or disintegration, you'll have different distributions of these, but this was just one example. So looking at how the mass partitions between the different uh, sieves in this, and then we looked at what are the properties of these different, uh, different uh, uh, fractions that we were able to generate. And so this is interesting. So we actually classified these. I actually had an undergraduate here at Montana State University go through this material and manually classify what type of tissue this, these different particles were based on uh, yeah, in, in these uh, different, different fractions. And you can see that the larger particle size was primarily this epidermis outer rind, which is this highly recalcitrant material that gets low yields. Um, and you could have various uh, relative abundances. And so the pith was the richest in the, uh, the, the low particle size uh, material. And so you can have you know, significant differences within the, in the composition of these, so the different tissue types. They also have significant differences in the properties. So this is looking at ash content and lignin content depending on the, uh, the sieve size. So you can see here, here's the lignin is highest in this fraction here and lowest in the pithrich fraction, which makes sense. But also the pithrich fraction is also the highest in ash here, that's on this axis. Another interesting thing is you have significant differences in hygroscopicity. So this is the uh, capacity for this biomass to sorb water. And so this is showing uh, an assay that we run in our lab, water retention value. This is basically taking a sample of biomass, putting it on a spin column, and then seeing how much biomass uh, remains after you've centrifuged it. And so this uh, have significant differences. And also these were all that we, we milled these all down to the same particle size to normalize these. And what you could see is, yeah, so the more recalcitrant, uh, higher lignin, um, more outer rind, more of the epidermis outer rind. Those were the, the, uh, the least, absorbed the least water, whereas these spongy pith tissues um, absorbed the most. And another thing we found was this is now we subjected these to enzymatic hydrolysis. So we took this fraction here, this uh, 200 mesh, which was primarily pith, and then we mixed all these things together. And then we compared the results. So this is the, uh, the deep pith fraction. So this is uh, these fractions combined here. This is enzyme loading versus, so this is increasing amount of enzyme that you add. This is the, the amount of sugars that you're getting out of this. So you can see here, 
yeah, you can get near theoretical if you load up the enzymes high enough. But one of the interesting things is, is this PIF, you could get very, very high yields, even at very, very low enzyme loadings. And then we even tried to dial back the uh, pretreatment severity a little bit and then still got very, very high yields with very mild pretreatment. So I thought that was, that was interesting as we demonstrated as proof of concept that this, that this works. And so I wanted to show out of this that fractionation offers the opportunity to yield biomass fractions that are enriched or depleted in properties. And this can result in streamlined or optimized processing. And so then the last thing I was gonna show, this is perfect timing. Uh, last thing I wanted to show was that, and so some of these results were the basis of a, uh, a, a DOE project that we actually just found out was funded one week ago. And so we're gonna be working with uh, Idaho National Laboratory on doing a physical fractionation of corn stover. And so the idea is to generate pith rich fractions and then other fractions that may uh, have uh, either value in other co-products applications or have uh, or result in streamlined processing for uh, these, uh, these materials entering a uh, biorefinery. And so, um, yeah, so they're planning on doing air classification or also just uh, sieving and looking at how basically how particle size, how, how the, the prior treatment of the biomass through particle size reduction or shredding or milling, hammer milling, knife milling, how that impacts how, bio, how the biomass fractionates between, uh, in, in, or yeah, how, how you can fractionate the biomass and how you can use that to generate uh, material or uh, fractions that might be enriched or depleted in certain properties. And then we're, off, we're planning on developing novel characterization tools that include uh, uh, water, applying water retention value and low field proton NMR relaxometry to look at the state of water in the cells and use that to, uh, as, as a proxy for understanding the relative abundance of tissue type or how this is going to be how this is going to process in, the, uh, in, in a biorefinery. And then also use uh, dynamic image analysis. So basically use a tool, something like flow cytometry to classify different, uh, different cell types. So something like, yeah, like these and be able to determine relative abundance of these things in different fractions with the ultimate goal of developing models to be able to predict performance of this pre-processing or, or air classification or fractionation step or develop models to be able to predict how the, how the materials will respond to a conversion process. And so that is that. Um, so this is my group at Montana State University. Um, and this is one student at Michigan State who did some of the work at, uh, on, on the, the sorghum. So yeah, that is it. And I'll be happy to take questions and I have, have a few minutes, perfect. You were getting cellulosic materials and lignin materials, those were two of the majors. And you spent a lot of time on the, the lignin. The cellulosic, when you, you, you would get sugars and those were primarily glucose, is that right? Yes, well you also, you'll get glucose and primarily xylose are the, are the main sugars that you would get from those. And then what, how did you, how did you use that? Did I get that in my breakfast cereal? Yeah. So what? So at least for most of the stuff that we're showing, we've we've also done work with uh, with with various yeasts and fungi for fermenting those, for making biofuels or making uh, making chemicals from those. Most of what we show here is just yeah. We stop at this is how much sugar you could get out of it, and if you wanted to take the sugar and then do something else with it, you could do that. But we don't need to show it. And so there, we ha I have other work where we're looking at how all of this upstream stuff impacts how, 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 the, the, how effective the fermentation is or how inhibitory it is to the fermentation. But yeah, typically what, what we'd be looking at is doing uh, some type of uh, bio biological conversion like fermentation to ethanol with these sugars. But you, could do, right, like you can do anything with, with xylose. Yeah, so the xylose you can you can uh, so there there are uh, microbes that can ferment that, or you can engineer microbes to ferment that to ethanol too. And so there's companies that people have been doing that since like the mid '90s. And so that's that, that, those are there's feasible technologies for those. Mm -hmm. So uh, ruminant animals break down xylose. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, with a uh, harmful 
release of uh, greenhouse gas. Mm -hmm. Do you do you imagine creating a fuel or, or a is is there a process? Would there be a way to break down cellulose and not release methane? Oh yeah, so that would. So ultimately what you did, so that's, that has to do with, uh, you know, the, whatever the equilibrium inside the rumen uh, with the, with the, the, the microbial community inside the rumen of, of the, of, of the animal, what's going on there. So ultimately you'd want to drive the, the equilibrium towards uh, volatile fatty acids over, over methane. So that, that was actually something, yeah, I mean, so that's, uh, so they, they actually don't get their energy from the, uh, from, from the biomass directly, right? They, the community ferments that to generate you know, lactic acid and acetic acid and succinic acid, and then they, they absorb those, and that's, that's where the most, that's so ultimately, that's, that seems like that's more of a, uh, more of a, um, <laughs> a diet problem for the, for the cow than, yeah. But I, I, yeah, I, I, don't, I don't know how to do that. <laughs> Maybe some animal science people are, yeah, no. Right, right. But it seems like a combination of your, of your knowledge might be really mm -hmm. useful. Mm -hmm. But yeah, so people have been, and I know there's, uh, there's work done possibly at uh, North Dakota State and at Michigan State where they're doing, taking pre-treated biomass. Well, actually, um, it, wasn't, it wasn't ADM. It was one of, there might have been ADM. They actually had, they were actually looking at pre-treating biomass and using it as an animal feed. They've done st actually studies in the animal science department, I know, at Michigan State, pre-treating biomass and then feeding it to, feeding it to cows. And I know one problem with that is like there's certain toxic inhibitors that get generated during the pretreatment process too that yeah, might, be, might be problematic for this. One more question. Um, are these, are the new like eco green plastic bags, does that have anything to do with, with this product? Um, yeah, so some of the, so that's, I, I actually don't don't know the eco green is that polylactic maybe Ross would know this is that polylactic acid have you ever heard of I actually I actually don't know but that's okay. I, that's probably so like so if there, there's like some some uh, biodegradable plastics there's like one one print, uh, product called uh, Sonora or Sonora Sonora I think it's Sonora that's uh, 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 produced by uh, Cargill the company. But uh, that's from generated from cornstarch. They hydrolyze the cornstarch, then they ferment that to lactic acid, and they polymerize that to make polylactic acid. So that's so th yeah, th those are renewable biodegradable polymers. I'm not I don't know what the eco green is though. Okay. Yeah. They could be the same thing. Yep.